If you've been on Twitter or YouTube over the last week, you've definitely heard of Devon, the brand new AI tool that supposedly acts and works just like a software engineer. And a lot of people are worried that this is gonna be the thing that takes over your job as a software engineer. And there's a lot of really impressive claims that Devon is making, but how true are they actually? And how impressive is this AI tool? I've gone through, I've done the research, read the papers, looked at all the different claims that they're making, and I really think Devin is not nearly as impressive or scary as people are making it out to be. And in this video, I kind of want to talk about what Devin is, what it actually can accomplish, and some of the things that it really cannot do. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project center. And today we're gonna to be talking about Cognition Labs' newest AI, which is Devon. And this is pretty much a brand new company that really hasn't released anything at all before until releasing this Devon AI. Now they put out a blog article, which I'm gonna link in the description of this video. And this blog article goes through quite a few different things about Devon, what it's capable of, what it can all do, and really is showcasing all of the best case scenarios for Devon because they want this to look as good as possible. And that's because most of the time, these AI companies, what they're trying to accomplish is actually getting tons and tons of funding. If we actually scroll to the top of this page, you can see that they've already raised $21 million in funding pretty much immediately from announcing this and all of that stuff going along with this. So really the goal of these types of blog articles and all this information is to really drum up as much hype as possible to get as much funding as possible into these particular AIs. So they want it to look as good as possible on paper. Now there's a few different things I wanna talk about in this video that specifically are the things people are most scared of. So we scroll down to this Devon's capabilities. There's a bunch of different videos that we can go through that talk about the different things Devon can do. And I wanna focus on some of the main ones and why they're maybe not as scary as you think. The first one here is that Devon can learn how to use unfamiliar technology. This one is scary to a lot of people because the AI essentially can teach itself using existing blog articles, videos, documentation, and so on, which sounds really scary, but honestly, we'll deep dive into this. It's not that bad. Another thing that we want to talk about is how it can actually find and fix bugs for you autonomously, which is very misleading compared to what they actually do in the video. Again, I'll dive deeper into why this is not nearly as scary as they make it out to be, especially based on the video that they show you. And then finally here, if we go down a little bit further, we can see that Devin is actually able to accomplish real world jobs on Upwork, which is again, something that's really scary for people because it's like replacing essentially jobs that people could do. But again, this may not be as scary as you think it is. Now, if we scroll all the way down to the bottom here, you may see this chart. This is probably something you've seen if you've heard people talk about Devon. And essentially, it's saying that Devon is able to accomplish 13.86% of GitHub issues. And that's how a lot of people present it. But essentially, it's just using this SWE bench, which is essentially a paper, a benchmark for testing AI against GitHub issues. And if we go to the actual site for this, you'll notice that this is actually much less of a scary thing than people think. They may think that, okay, it can solve essentially, what is it? 13.8% of all GitHub issues. But really what this does is it takes just 12 GitHub repositories. If we scroll all the way down here, you can see it's 12 popular Python repositories and it's only pulling 2,300 different pull request issues. So the way that this works is it takes 2,300 issues and the associated pull request that was generated for that issue. And each of these pull requests has test data that was written for it for unit test. And in order to be considered passing for the AI model, all it has to do is write code that passes the unit tests that were written to go along with that PR. It doesn't actually mean that the code is 100% correct or that it does things exactly like it's supposed to. It just has to pass those unit tests, which is generally a good idea to say that the code is most likely correct. Now, if we go ahead and we look at an example of one of the issues that is used inside of this data set, you'll see that this is an issue for some Python library for something where new lines were being added in wrong places. And you'll notice something really important about this is that the issue is very well documented. You can see here is exactly what I searched for. Here is exactly what's happening. You can see the expected behavior, what the observed behavior should be, how to reproduce this, all the different stuff with versioning, configuration files. I mean, this is an incredibly well-written issue, much better than 99% of GitHub repositories out there. And this is actually a recurring theme between pretty much all of these different GitHub issues that are tested. They have very good documentation in the issue side of things. Now, if we look at the pull request that was submitted by an actual user, this is not generated by AI, you'll notice that the amount of files changed was 10. It's not a huge amount of data that was changed. And if we go all the way down to the test, you can see that this person wrote a few different test cases inside of here. So if we look at a few of these different tests, you can see there's just a couple tests that are being written and modified. So this is essentially what the data is being tested on is these like two or three different test cases that were added or modified. So really, as long as the AI model is able to actually correctly write some code that passes these tests, that's the only thing that's being checked on. But in general, that's a pretty good indicator that they were able to solve the problem. And it's still impressive that they're able to solve essentially 
actually 13% of these different problems. But another thing to worry about here is if we scroll down, you'll notice that Devin was evaluated on a random 25% subset of the data. Now, I'm not sure why they decided to go with only 25% of the data instead of doing 100% of the data. It makes me a little bit concerned because since there's no way for us to actually test with Devin right now, since it's a closed off system currently, it's not open to the public, it's a little bit scary for me to think maybe they kind of randomly chose 25% until they got a 25% that they gave them this good number for their announcement to try to raise money. They could have just continually tested a random 25% until they landed on a random 25% that gave them the best possible number because obviously some issues are going to be easier than others to solve. So it's a little bit strange they didn't do it with 100%. I don't know if there are certain resource constraints or if there was a different data set they used or what it was, but it would be much more comforting to actually see that they did this on 100% of the data instead of only 20 25% of it, especially because, like I said, there's only 2,300 issues. So doing 25% versus 100% is not that big of a difference. So if you see this type of chart being thrown around where it's like they can solve 14% of all issues on GitHub, it's very misleading. It's 14% of issues in a very small subset across a very few select repositories that have very good documentation and very good issue support. Now, the other things I talked about, one thing is that this AI can learn for itself. This is the video that they mentioned that specifically that the AI can actually learn from blog articles and resources out there. So in this particular video, this person is asking Devin, they're pasting in a link to a blog article and they're saying, hey, this blog article says that it can do X, Y, and Z. And it even mentions in the blog article, a script that you can use to do this. That's what they tell Devin. And they say, hey, can you set this up and generate images for me with these specific criteria? So if we go over to that blog article, at the very bottom, you see that it has this try it yourself section, and it even has a link to a GitHub repository with that script. If we open up that script, you can see right here is the GitHub repository with all the information you need to be able to set this up. It even tells you the exact code you need to use. Obviously, it has the script files and everything. So essentially, all the code to do this is already written. It's just giving you instructions on how to get set up with that. So Devin's not really writing too much custom code. It's just mostly following these instructions that are set up in this blog article and set up in this GitHub repository. And it's able to generate these things based on the code that's already been written by other people. And I noticed something really specific about this prompt they give it. They specifically in the prompt say, here's the blog article. And they mention that there's a script in the blog article that is supposed to be used to generate those things. So they're specifically telling this AI, hey, look for the script inside this blog article. They maybe ignored everything else in the blog article, went straight to the script and looked at this actual GitHub repository with all the information and code to be able to do what it needs to do. So it says that it can teach itself based on these different things. And sure, there may be some degree of that to it, but the fact that they had to specifically prompt telling it where the script was, telling it where the blog article was, and having that blog article pretty much already have all the code inside of it makes me a little bit leery saying that it can really learn for itself in all situations. It seems rather limited in its capabilities in this regard, at least based on this particular video example. Now, the next one that I think is kind of scary for a lot of people is that this AI is able to find and fix bugs in your specific code. And if you go through and that you watch this video, you'll realize that it's really actually not finding and fixing these bugs for you. So if you watch this video, essentially what happens is this guy wrote some particular code to do something inside of his repository. And he wrote that code, but he didn't want to write any test cases for that code. So there's no test at all for this code. And he comes to Devin and he says, hey, Devin, I would like you to write a test for this code. It's specifically asking in the prompt, I would like you to write test for this particular code. And it's going to write out that test case. And what happens is they, he goes back and forth a couple times with Devin asking it to write more and more tests based on more specific things. And finally, Devin writes a test that actually fails. And Devin isn't necessarily finding this bug per se. He's telling it to write test. Then Devin is going ahead and it's writing out these tests. And in the process of writing out the test that this developer specifically told Devin to write out, it is then finding that these tests do not pass. Now, the cool thing about Devin in this regard that I will give it credit for is that when it finds this bug in the code, essentially it says, hey, this test does not pass. It actually goes through and finds where that bug is in the code to make the test pass and is able to solve the bug, which is essentially one line of code that needs to be added to the actual thing. As you can see right here on line 36, he adds this one single line of code and that essentially fixes the bug. So Devin is able to go through, it's writing these tests and it's finding the bug. It's really cool, but as you can see, it's not just looking at a code repository and saying, hey, I found the bug for you. Instead, it's kind of a very step-by-step -step process of, hey, write these tests for me. This test failed, so obviously there must be a bug. It's a very cherry-picked example and they're really kind of 
blowing it out of proportion a little bit with the language they're using. It's not necessarily finding bugs in your code. It's just writing these tests and through that process happens to stumble upon a bug. Now, the last one I wanna talk about is honestly the one that is probably the most impressive and that is that Devon is able to accomplish work on Upwork. So if we look at this particular Upwork tax, obviously they very much cherry picked it. They chose the one thing that is obviously going to work for them. There's probably hundreds of Upwork examples that do not work for them, but this one is very simple for them because essentially all that this person is asking is, hey, all I want you to do is to take this model that already exists and I want you to be able to implement it and use it for me, an AI model specifically. So in this video, essentially the person goes through and they tell Devin, hey, here's this thing, this model that I want you to implement and start using. And it goes through and it implements that model and it starts using the information from it and it ends up generating some results. Now, one important thing to note about pretty much everything that Devin is doing is that it's not particularly fast. This example for this Upwork thing, I think took about two, maybe three hours to actually accomplish. And a lot of these other things are taking an hour, two hours to actually run through and generate this code. So it's not like ChatGPT or AI code pilot or something like that, where it's really quickly giving you responses. This is a relatively slow process and it might be very iterative where you're working directly with it, trying to help prompt it along, which is another reason why I think that you shouldn't really be super worried. While it can do these really cool things where it generates some code based on different GitHub repositories or articles, which is really cool to see, it's something that still requires technical knowledge in order to use. If I were to give my wife this tool and tell her, hey, you can use this to solve Upwork problems or something like that, she would maybe be able to solve some really simple things. But as soon as that Devin ran into a snag or didn't really know what to do, she would obviously be completely underwater and not know where to go because she doesn't have that technical background. So you still need those problem solving and technical skills in order to actually use a tool like this. And I keep using the word tool because really this is a tool. This is something that software engineers and developers are gonna be able to use to speed up their coding workflow, maybe make certain things easier for them, maybe make some tedious tasks not be something that you need to manually do, just like things like AI Autocomplete, like ChatGPT and Copilot have made doing certain things in coding a lot easier. They haven't replaced your job, they just modified how you work and made certain things easier. I think Devin is just another example of a tool that's going to make actually working in programming a little bit easier. It's going to clean up certain things for you, make certain learnings a little bit easier, but the actual knowledge of being a developer where you actually need to think about how to solve real world problems and you need to develop custom solutions to complex problems and just be a problem solver, that is something that AI is really not capable of replacing currently and something I don't think it'll be able to replace in the future. These tools are really cool and they have a lot of potential, but really their potential is to empower you as a developer and not to replace you. Now, don't get me wrong. I think these tools are really impressive and really cool, but if you're worried about Devin replacing your job, you really don't have to worry about it because you as a developer, knowing how to think like a programmer are the core skills you have and being able to write out like code for certain things is not your core skill. It's your ability to problem solve and so on that these AI tools really struggle with and are probably never going to be able to replicate. Now, with that said, I really hope you enjoyed this video and have a good day.